astro imaging channel. Tonight, Ryan Blankenship is going to tell us some stuff about the polar aligning. He's going to tell us about Pole Master and how to check it out, how to do it, and stuff like that. Ryan's presented before, so I'm sure we're all looking forward to that presentation. Um, I wanted to do some things here with you before we get started. Go to a screen share here, share the screen, and then I'm uh, opening up. Um, uh, as everybody can see my screen here, um, these are the shows that are scheduled. You can get this by going to the astroimagingchannel.com and going to upcoming shows. And you can see that, uh, well, we've got some that have already been come and gone. Tonight, Ryan's going to be talking about um, dialing in polar alignment. Next Sunday night, Daniel Perry, who's from the Riverside Astronomical Society and uh, has a website named California Stars, will be telling us about powering your equipment while you're away from home. He's not going to be talking about where to start with equipment, although if we can talk him into it, maybe we can get him back some other time and he can tell us about it. Uh, at the end of this month, Ron Brecher will be talking about advanced pixel math and insight. Uh, and uh, he's not gonna. He's gonna be telling us about how to smooth things and and some other things. Not the same stuff that we've had before in pixel math. Pixel math can so, do so many things that we're gonna see a lot of different ways to to use it. April seventh, we're not gonna have a show because uh, the people who run the shows uh, will be off doing um, uh, uh, NEF, and so we won't be around. So we hope to see a few of you at NEF and and uh, visit. and, and NEAC. Uh, and NEAC will be at NEAC also. Fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't signed up for those things, I think you could probably still do it. And, um, you know, come on over. It's, it, it is expensive, but you do get to hang around with some really good imagers. April 14th, Ray Graylack will be coming back. Uh, re this is rescheduled from when we had that problem before. And I think we've, thanks to Tolga and Adam and the guys, uh, they, they have managed to pull these uh, uh, things off now. We're getting a little bit better at it. Bob Denny's coming on April 21st to tell us about ACP and, and Astrom Alpaca. Tom Bash will hear, be here at the end of next month telling us about high resolution planetary imaging. And although I haven't updated my, uh, this schedule yet, um, Charles Bracken will be here on May 5th. I think you all know Charles Bracken. He's written some books that are pretty important. He's writing a new one, incidentally. But uh, he's going to be telling us about how he picks targets. How do you determine which targets would be good to image tonight? Um, on the 12th, I'm, I'm not sure if we've got something scheduled or not. I, I've got Amy and Justin's reception, so I'm not going to be here. I'm going to a wedding that day. It's um, also Mother's Day. Pardon? Uh, 12th is the Mother's Day, so we may want to... Uh, okay. I don't know. We'll talk about it. We may cancel that day. Okay. But I'm okay. Uh, Greg um, Crinklaw will be coming on the 19th of May. He's going to be talking about Sky Tools 4. It's done some revisions on that program, and he wants to tell us about it. And for those uh, who – we had a comment the other day uh, about a few weeks ago that says, hey, let's have some really top-rate imagers tell us some stuff. So besides uh, the few people we've got coming anyway, I mean, uh, um, we've, we've got um, uh, Brecher coming along and uh, at the end of this month, at the end of May, um, Sydney from Astrobin is gonna be here. He makes fantastic images and we don't know exactly what he's gonna be talking about yet, but what Tolka's talked him into is talking about how he makes those fantastic images. So, um, you know, keep joining us. We are still looking for presenters. We, um, if you've got any ideas, if you know of anybody, and certainly like Ryan tonight, Ryan volunteered to do this. And uh, we really appreciate that, Ryan. And as a matter of fact, I think it's about time we kind of turned it over to you. So let me get out of here and back to here. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Stop sharing my screen. And we're back to you, Ryan. Go ahead and take over. All right, and welcome everybody. Uh, tonight I wanna go over what, uh, how I use Pole Master and, you know, how it, how it can uh, help us dial in our uh, polar alignment. So let's get into it. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, yes, we can. Okay. 
So the agenda, I'm just going to do a quick who am I and why poll master was good for me. And then we'll get into uh, how we can get the poll master as well as uh, installing it. Uh, then we'll go into the software for poll master and the polar alignment process. And then dialing in, fine tuning the, the alignment uh, using PHD2's drift alignment tool. And then I have some shout outs and thanks. I want to do at the end if there's time. So who am I? Well, I'm a network engineer by trade. So I focused on break fix. So troubleshooting and being detail oriented is uh, right in my wheelhouse. So anybody that's been in Astro Imaging for any amount of time, you're spend a lot of time troubleshooting uh, various problems. So that's one of the things I like about the hobby is it helps keep those skills uh, fresh. Uh, I am a gearhead, but uh, my wallet begs to differ. Second or la next is uh, I like to learn new things and I pick them up relatively easy uh, since I am in IT. You know, things change sometimes on a yearly basis. So you always have to keep on your toes. And with Astro Imaging, you know, that, that skill set helps uh, with that because we're, you know, we move to a new piece of software, a new piece of gear, and we have to learn it quickly so that we don't interrupt our, our imaging training. And to give you my experience, I've only been doing this for about a year. Uh, roughly this time last year is when I ordered my, my rig and started uh, building it and adding on to it. So I am a uh, beginner, but I am getting better. And, you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great year. And lastly, uh, my presentations don't look as nice as some of the people here on, like Alex can do. Uh, so if they look a little basic, I'm gonna, I'll apologize in advance. Uh, you know, still learning uh, uh, this nice software. So with that, let's get into where can we order the poll master. Uh, on the screen, we have High Point Scientific's uh, entry for it. You can also pick it up on other websites. Uh, you can you pick them up used through Cloudy Nights and other classified ads. Uh, brand new. This was just from the other day. You know, it's two hundred ninety-five bucks, so it's it's not exactly cheap. Uh, but when you have you have to balance that with your time. In my case, you know, I was spending sometimes an hour out there trying to get that thing polar aligned, and an hour every couple of days or once a week. You know, it, it was cost justified, in my opinion, to spend the 300 bucks and go ahead and get it. It definitely saved my time. I can get polar aligned uh, in generally 15 minutes or less now. And once I got once I got the process down, uh, the key thing to remember here is you need to choose your mount adapter. Since I, since I have a CGM2, uh, the CGM selection uh, was appropriate. Here we have the CGM2 that I have. Uh, the little dust cap there is where, we, where we're gonna install it. Uh, normally we would remove that and take the cover off the back, put in our polar, polar finder scope and you know, get down on our hands and knees, look up there and do what we need to do. Uh, but this will make things a lot easier. Uh, that's the adapter that you have to select. As you can see, it's got a little retention screw here. This uh, forward ring comes out and actually screws to the back of the, uh, the pole master. And then that retention screw holds everything in place. There are some little Allen screws, uh, some set screws that are on the inside. Those are what hold the, uh, the mount inside that little sleeve area on, uh, or holds the adapter into the mount uh, in, in that little sleeve area. They are a little bit of a pain to, uh, to, to tighten down because you do have to use a little Allen wrench inside, uh, inside the adapter. So it's, it's kind of feel, uh, you know, you, you gotta have some nimble fingers to get, the, get in there sometimes. There, there's the pole master installed. It's relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Um, 
what I've pointed out here is the cable connection. I currently have it mounted on the west side of my mount. The instructions actually say to put it to the east. I found that to be uh, a little daunting when I was first using it, uh, simply because the image is 180 degrees rotated. So up is down and down is up. So I put it to the west, which meant when I'm looking at Polaris and then I'm looking at my screen, they are identical. Now, the problem with that is, is everything you do is now in reverse. So if you mount it to the other side, if you move your adjustment screws so that the mount moves east, the screen, the image on the screen is going to move east. So it's a small little adjustment I have, I do in my brain to remember, okay, east is west, west is east. And it's been working out pretty well for me since I like to have it visually the same as if I'm standing behind the scope and looking at Polaris. Um, it was also in the summer months, it, it helped uh, re remove the, uh, the, the trees that, were, that would be at the top of the screen. It kind of threw me off. So having it this way, the trees were at the bottom of the screen and it helped me orient where I was at uh, as far as where the Polaris was and everything. Uh, now we're going to get into the uh, software itself. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It, if you look in the top left of the screen, you'll see where my mouse is. You'll see it has instructions step by step. Just follow them through. But I'm going to go through step to step by step so we can so we'll have a feel for anybody that's uh, maybe having some issues or looking to do this. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is set your camera parameters. Uh, I always use 200 with uh, exposure. It's 200 milliseconds with a gain of 70. That works pretty well for most conditions where I'm located. Uh, stars are bright enough, and but not overly bright. And you know, it works. It just works well for me. And then we would once we have those set, we click finished. And we get to the next screen, and it initially doesn't look like this. Uh, what you have to do is uh, double click on Polaris. And as I say, step one, follow the directions, of course. Step two, you want to select Polaris by double clicking on it. Now, if you watch any tutorials out there on the web, uh, a lot of guys try to say, you know, there's a little green cross here. It's probably hard to see on your screen, but it's on the top end of Polaris here. Um, they say try to get that as centered as possible uh, when you double click. When you're using a laptop and a touchpad, uh, that's kind of difficult. Uh, but we select Polaris and the other stars so many times. Uh, the software is probably intelligent enough to uh, do the calculations on where the center of the star is. And the sheer number of times that we have to select it, it, it does a really good job, in my opinion, of, uh, you know, knowing where Polaris is within a few pixels. And then lastly, use, you can use the slider that I have highlighted, or you can use your left and right arrow keys. And these circles will rotate around Polaris. And what you're going to want to do is line them up so that each one has four stars in it. It's a specific pattern that is uh, specific to Polaris. There will be another pattern if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. So everything I'm doing here is for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, clearly, I'm not in the Southern, so I couldn't do anything for that. Uh, but as you can see, it's it walks you through everything. So it's, you shouldn't have any problem if you are in the Southern Hemisphere uh, getting that pattern and what you need to select if you follow the instructions. And as you can see here, I have these stars inside those circles. Uh, those circles are static. So if you're closer to the North Pole, then you know they're going to be closer into Polaris. And if you're closer to the equator, they're going to be further away. Or excuse me, I have that reversed. Sorry about that. Uh, if you're Closer to uh, the North Pole, they will be further away from Polaris. Uh, so they will be 
more towards the center of those circles. Uh, I'm about midway, I'm at 38 degrees. So they're towards the bottom edge of those circles. Uh, but primarily we wanna try to get them so that they are as close to uh, center as possible. Uh, it's not always possible. As you can see here, this one in the lower right or lower left is just a little hair off, but the other ones are pretty well lined up with the middle. So that's an acceptable error. And once you're done with that, uh, we'll, we click success. And then it asks us to choose Polaris or select a star other than Polaris. And I like to go further out. Uh, as you can see here where the, where the little hand is, uh, you can go in uh, closer to some of the closer stars. But I like to go out a little bit further. It helps. It uh, gives it a greater degree of uh, triangulation of where the center of rotation is going to be. And here you can see the little green uh, crosshair that's just to the left of the uh, selected star. And once you double click that, it's going to ask you to rotate your mount. Now you can do it with the clutches. I prefer to do it with the hand controller. Um, and we'll see why here in a little bit. Uh, this little white arrow does show up on the screen. I did not put that in there. But you wanna rotate it roughly 30, degree, 30 degrees. If you only go 25 or if you go 40, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I've you know, we don't have to go exactly 30 degrees. And then, but remember which star that you did select. That's why I like to use this one down here. Uh, it's a nice little triangle. So I can always remember which one it is based on which, which point of the triangle that it, I've selected. And then once you move to the next step, you will double click it again. Once it's moved about 30 degrees, I think I only moved it about 20 degrees this time. And it'll ask you to rotate it again. And then we select it again. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty quick. Uh, the only time you're really waiting is how fast your mount actually moves. And then once you uh, get past that, oh, one thing I wanted to notice, you see it says up here, reset. Uh, you know, on a couple occasions, I got a, over, a little overzealous and a little ahead myself, ahead of myself, and I actually selected Polaris, and was at this point in the in the process, and I had to reset, go back, select a different star. So it's nice that they put that in there for those of us that like to get a little ahead of ourselves. And once you're finished with that, after you've selected the star for the second time, this green circle uh, comes up. That is your rotation. And the little red crosshair in the middle is your uh, celestial pole or uh, center of rotation. Now, what you're gonna wanna do, and this is why I like to use the hand controller when I'm moving the mount and not the clutches simply because I can then go into the hand controller uh, on the Celestron, you go into tele telescope, go to home and hit enter. And you can watch the star as it's going along the, the circle to make sure that it does in fact stay on that green line. If it does stay on that green line, then we know we did up to this point, we're good to go. Once you get that done and uh, you, you click the finished up in the top, it's gonna ask you to double click players once again. And yeah, so once you've done that, you'll click success and your nice little uh, circular patterns come back up and you'll want to just tweak your uh, those circles just a little bit. I use the left and right arrow key at that point and just, you know, go, go left to, to click or two presses of the key, 
go right to then to again see where it's uh you know where those stars are as centered as possible uh in the edge of the circles and then click success now if you notice i have pointed out here the little uh white broken white circle with the crosshair in it that is where polaris should be so that's where we're going to end up moving our mount viewpoint polaris to so after we click success we're going to be moving the uh alt and as uh adjustments so in this particular case i need to go west a little bit and a little bit down in azimuth <clears throat> excuse me and as you can see here anything you put your mouse over you're going to get this little fly out up here i should have mentioned that earlier i apologize and it's real nice here because you can see when polaris moves into that little white circle and you're not relying on like some of us that are a little older some poor eyesight and looking at small pixels uh, now the key thing on this is once you get it into the circle at least key to me uh, in my process is once you get it in the circle get it close to the center but don't try to perfectly center it at this point it's okay to have it off center a little bit and actually i prefer it to be a little bit off center uh, because in the next uh, screens you'll see we'll have an, another set of adjustments and because of that we do not lock down our adjustment screws just leave them as they are and uh, because we will be using them one more time and once we've got that centered or roughly centered into the, the circle we click finished and now we have to double click players once again and then once we have a successful mark there it'll come up and say please start the monitor up to this point it's usually takes me about uh you know four to six minutes to to get to this point this is after uh you know using star alignments to build your model uh in the in the software uh i it depends on when i'm doing it uh you know it's ideal to do this before you do the star alignment but sometimes i like to check it uh just to you know do my star alignment make sure i'm think i'm where i'm at and then i'll come in here and do this while i'm waiting for uh the twilight hours to end uh because i usually try to do that around you know i usually try to do this about half an hour uh, before the twilight ends and we can start imaging so oh, excuse me so we'll we'll click start monitor and this is where i messed up for about the first month i was focused on this little green patch here in the middle i completely spaced that there was a window over to the left and it's clearly a zoomed in version of what's here in the middle the two white boxes are the stars that the software is monitoring to get us the uh, the, the red, you know, the, the center of rotation and where we should be moving it to. And what we're going to be doing is moving this red uh, crosshair on top of the green or the green on top of the red, whichever way you prefer to look at it. So the red, as it says here, is is the axis and the green is the pole. So if you want to be literal, we're going to be moving the red onto the green. This, <clears throat> this is, as I say here, this is where you take your time. And I, I purposefully did that in caps because I want to stress that. I'm not yelling at you. I just want to stress that you want to take your time in this, in this uh, process uh, simply because this will save you time when you're verifying your alignment through PhD2 or whatever tool you want to use. Um, also, uh, going back a few slides where I said, you know, having it a little bit off center is good because as we all know, those adjustment screws, 
they have a little bit of tension on them. And then once you hit that breaking point, almost like an earthquake, the two uh, uh, tectonic plates get that stress and then they release. Our adjustment screws are kind of the same thing. They get that tension and all of a sudden they release and it jerks to the left or jerks to the right. And so having it more off center than not helps you get that feel of where it's going to be and uh, get that get that dialed in a little bit better or, or at least have the feel to get it dialed in a little bit better. And as you can see here, I had it pretty well centered up on uh, on this. Now, this will jump around a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's all dependent on seeing conditions, atmospheric conditions. Uh, if you got any uh, real thin, wispy clouds, uh, those monitor stars are going to be hopping around and which is going to cause that little red cross to, to jump, you know, north, south, east, west a little bit. So you're going to have to kind of watch it for a few seconds, see what that pattern is as far as how much it's jumping around and do your best guess as far as what the center is of that uh, little oscillation pattern and try to get that as line, lined up as uh, good as you can. I usually take about uh, three to five minutes just on this little part alone, uh, simply because as nice as PhD2 drift alignment is, uh, I always seem to choose, you know, when it, when I need to go down and I, I go up for some reason, and then I got to go back and, and the time, and we'll get into it later, the time to monitor, uh, you know, three to five minutes here can save, you know, as much as 10 to 15 minutes later. So once, once we are confident that uh, we've got our red and green crosses lined up pretty well, we click finished. And then that's it as far as the pole master application. It's very straightforward. It gives you the walkthrough instructions. Um, you know, they, I feel they did a great job in, you know, making this as easy as possible for us amateurs to do this stuff. So at this point, I'm going to break to say, do we have any questions? We certainly do. We're going to go all the way back up to, I think, um, um, Larry, um, of Bob and Larry, who um, um, wanted to know, <laughs> that's an inside joke, I wanted to know where you're from, Ryan. Where did you, where are you coming from? Where are your image? Uh, I'm, I image about uh, an hour, you know, 60 miles. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say an hour, but depending on traffic, it could be three hours. Uh, 60 miles from D.C. in northern central Virginia. Okay. Uh, uh, Culpeper County, if anybody's interested. So on the Bortle scale, or Bortle scale uh, it's roughly, you know, four and a half, five. Uh, so not dark, dark, but dark enough that I, that I don't, I haven't seen the need for light pollution filters yet. Okay. As, as we get encroachments out here, uh, I might have to do narrow band or something later on. Steve, you're in the room. You can go ahead and ask that question. If you turn your mic on. If you're in the room. Yep. I'm here. Uh, I was just wondering if you've ever in the dark reached, you know, like when you're first setting up sometimes I pick up my uh, the base and I put it on top of the tripod and I wonder if you've accidentally grabbed the pole master by by accident and you know sheared it off the, the base or something like that it seems like that'd be a concern of mine uh, that can be a concern um, the nice thing if you remember back in the slides uh, yeah that little set screw um, that tensioner screw uh, so that you can take that base off. Uh, so if it is a concern, you can remove the pole master uh, after you're done polar lining. If it does, you know the it does come with a screw-on dust cap uh, that does come included with the kit. So you know it's just loosen that screw, take the pole master off, put it, you know, take it inside, put it in a drawer, you know, put it in your observatory if you have one, uh, so that that's not a 
a concern. Um, due to the weight, um, I move my uh, motor, the, the head, the mount, uh, I leave it attached to the tripod. So when I'm moving, uh, you know, I'm carrying the tripod and the, uh, the motors all in one unit. So I'm usually uh, cradling uh, the motors in my elbows using the, uh, the counterweight bar and the back of uh, one of the motors. So that has not been a problem for me as of yet. Okay, thanks. Um, Glenn's, I use a pole master and after I line, I leave it on to check to see if I bumped it. But the alignment points are jumping around all over the place. The stars are solid. I'm shooting over the city into a red zone. I'm wondering if that could be the problem or is the problem other people are having. And George comments that that's probably atmospheric turbulence. Would you like to comment on that? Apparently, this, the alignment points bounce around a little bit. Uh, yes. You know, I think we talked about this a little bit before the, the show started. You know, you can you can dial this thing in and get it as perfect as you can. Uh, walk away for five minutes, get a cup of coffee, come back and just for uh, spits and giggles, uh, check your polar alignment again. And it's going to be off a little bit. Uh, it's just the nature of the way, uh, you know, the the how you select the stars, the atmospheric conditions, uh, you know, maybe the ground settled a, a, a couple of nanometers while you're walking by. You know, there, there's so many different conditions, but it's usually uh, the, the atmospheric conditions. If you're shooting into a red, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of atmospheric turbulence from the heat rising, uh, especially in the summer, that these little uh, reference stars that it's using by the uh, uh, the white boxes there, they're going to be jumping around a little bit just because of those atmospheric and seeing conditions, which is going to cause your your alignment to look like it's jumping around. Uh, but as long as you're not, as long as you don't bump the mount itself, you're probably still within uh, you know I would estimate you know half to one arc minute with, you know, from where you, where you started to begin with. When um, you were describing that the circles for finding, for placing the other stars, that they move depending on um, if you're further north or further south. You remember that portion there? Yes. Uh, the, 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 the distance from the central point changes according to your declination. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that that's a an assumption, uh, simply based on uh, my understanding of uh, angles and you know everything. That if you're closer to the center point, anything in the periphery is going to look further uh, to the periphery, and the further you are away then it's going to look like it's closer to the center point. So in my opinion, in my understanding, if you're closer to the North Pole, those stars should look like they're a little bit further, more towards the center of those circles. Um, you know, I haven't traveled up to Canada, so I can't verify that. Um, okay. But that would be my assumption. It's, I couldn't, I can't imagine why it would change is is the image that I'm seeing, like the image you've got on the screen right now, is that a strict image out of the camera or is that a projected image of some sort uh, besides, you know, besides the boxes and things like that? Is that yeah. it? Yeah, uh, if I go back, so uh, so this, the, the, the main portion of the screen, that mm -hmm. is straight off the camera. Okay. So when you move the mount, you're going to see, you know, with uh, roughly half a second, you know, quarter second delay, you'll see the stars move. Okay. Um, the when I move them out to the same position it was during polar alignment, the jumping usually disappears. I don't know where that's about, Brandon. I am. Uh, Christopher points out that he keeps his um, he uses his his pole master 
is attached to the OTA dovetail and he uses it as a sky cam pointing at the sky all the time, which uh, several people said was a cool idea. Uh, yeah, I, I could, that, that would be interesting. Larry Groom points out that the circles and the procedures are confirming that, um, yeah, that first part of what you did, you're basically saying, yeah, this is Polaris for sure. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. Steve Bradley says he just leaves his um, um, on to check to, to see as if alignment's changing during the night. I'll tell you what, if things are changing that much during the night, something's got to be done. I mean, you shouldn't have a position. Does, does it actually change that much? I've, I, you know, I, I live with observatories most of the time, and they don't change. Um, but when you're out, you know, with the camping rigs, does, does your polar alignment change that much? Uh, aside from settling of the ground, if yeah. you're on hard pat, you know, uh, dirt, yeah. Uh, I could see the movement of your OTA shift in east and west. Uh, I could see maybe you get some settling. Um, I've had my rig out there on the ground uh, for a week straight, and I've rarely had to make any adjustments uh, okay. from night to night. Um, Glenn, no, because of its jumping around. I don't, okay. I don't think these are questions so much as a discussion going on. Um, I asked a question. I asked a question and somebody answered it. Congratulations, George. Um, what I want you to do is go out there with your scope in exactly the same position and measure it again and see if it's still five hundredths of an arc minute off. Um, what um, Ryan was alluding to earlier is that um, um, we had a discussion before we started. Has anybody ever run the polar alignment routine and found out exactly how far they're off and then immediately rerun it before the ground has had a chance to shift, before anything has had a chance to shift? And has anybody ever gotten exactly the same number twice? And the answer among us was nope, it, it always changes. There, these things have a limited. Um, uh, precision and the repeat validity is probably greater than that five hundredths of an arc minute that you're talking about, George. So while it's good to get, it's not necessarily a hundred percent accurate. Did you want to comment any more about that, Ryan? No, I think I pretty much covered yeah, that. Yeah. And Christopher and various other people have said, hey, you know what? This pole master thing's good enough. You don't even have to do a, a drift line, a formal drift line, you know, like like I described a few weeks back when we were talking about uh, uh, PhD's polar alignment routines. Yeah, I'll, I'll show here uh, during the PhD2 session. Yes, I, I would agree you don't have to. Uh, but being that I go out there half an hour be before twilight and do this if I need to, uh, I always check the drift alignment anyways, just, uh, you know, since I'm not going to be Im imaging for half an hour, 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, Larry points out, he, he wants to know if anybody's uh, use, using the pole master to align on a paramount rig. And then does the advanced alignment in the paramount, I assume, and compared the results. And that's what we were just talking about, that you could use the same method over and over again and you get different results but you can use different methods and you get different results and it's not necessarily because you're using different methods it's just because none of the methods are precise to the point that you might think they are yep um and then more conversation um Ryan, have you joined Novak and OVAC? No, I have not, not yet. Okay. Uh, what, is, what is Novak? Uh, I believe it's the Northern Virginia Astronomical oh, Club. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it, it's it's on my bucket list to do. Uh, last year was a little ter ter uh, had a little uh, dust up. Uh, you know, I started off the year laid off, and then I ended the year laid off as well. So I just now started uh, my new job two two months ago. So, uh, you know, getting yeah. into yet another club is uh, is on 
on my to-do list, but uh, right now, uh, lower priority than you know, making sure I'm doing good at my job. So. <laughs> okay, and then Christopher sent us a picture of a of a um, his scope uh, with his pole master set up on it. Hey, um, I wanted to explain something before we go on with the with Ryan's presentation about the um, uh, the other things he's going to talk about. Um, uh, for those of you who are joining us and aren't familiar with the toy, the Astro Imaging Channel so much, um, there's only about six or eight people can get what we call into the room. Um, and those are basically the presenters and Tolga, me, Adam, and a few other people who help, Eric, who help actually run the show and, and everything else like that. Um, and um, so we can only put about eight people in there. And and we actually start this thing at about 10 minutes after uh, nine, I guess, Eastern time, 10 minutes after six in California. And uh, we have a, a little discussion beforehand to make sure everything's gonna work right, and know what we're doing and stuff like that. And then we start the show live at 6.30. And um, you're, I, I, we'd love to all, you know, have you all in the room, but we can't, T technically we can't do that. Um, and so we do have a way for you to ask questions. And if you go over to the uh, Astro Imaging Channel uh, website, you can see that there's a little uh, funny looking thing with the character on it. You just press on that. You can you can ask all your questions. And that's where we're getting all these questions for people. So keep them coming and we'll continue with Ryan's presentation. Go ahead, Ryan, take it away. All right, and so, uh, I'm not going to say I'm a pro, but uh, my pro tip is, uh, you know, your your camera is dead, and uh, you know we're we're at, up to this point we're using an external camera outside of your imaging chain, uh, so it's a perfect time if you need to do something like biases where, you know, you're not taking into con consideration temperature or that anything like that, or if you have a cold camera, um, you know. This is a perfect time to take your darks or your biases, and that's usually what I'm doing when I'm when I am doing my polar alignment. Is as you can see here, I connect up to backyard EOS and you know run some biases or run some darks. You know, update the calibration library basically. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out that you know just because you're doing one thing doesn't mean your your equipment can't be doing something else as well. Uh, so now we're going to get into PhD2. Um, so hopefully, you know, use whatever software you're comfortable with. Uh, I'm comfortable with PhD2. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. Uh, the first thing we're going to want to do is uh, open up PhD2, connect to our camera, the mount, uh, slew to a sector of the sky that is near the equator. Uh, the celestial equator that is, and I've always been told east of the meridian, so that's what I go with. I think PhD two actually just says you know near the equator, but I've always been told go east of the meridian, and so that's what I do. And I'm I'm given my process, my workflow. So uh, you know if you use a different one and it's working for you, uh, great, more power to you. Uh, then we're going to go up to tools and then click drift align. And as you can see down here, you know, there's a little yellow box that says align by analyzing star drift near the celestial equator, and it's accurate. Uh, there is a polar drift align as well, and a static. I've never used static. I have used polar uh, before, where you're more towards uh, the celestial pole. Uh, it's less accurate, but it helps you dial in uh, close and then switch over to the drift align. Uh, but since we're pretty confident in our polar alignment using Pole Master, we're just going to go straight into Drift Align. And then you're going to get this nice Drift Align box that comes up. The thing to remember here is which axis are we measuring? And it's going to be in this top section, this top banner. And in this particular case, it's the azimuth adjustment. So whatever we're doing, we're going to make sure that we're gonna make the adjustments based on that axis. So in this case, it's azimuth. So we don't wanna be tilting that thing up and down and uh, you know, wondering why, why it's not adjusting. Um, so that's the, that's the key takeaway there. Make sure you're uh, simply because I have done that, 
so that was a learning experience to always make sure that we are doing the right axis in, or the correct axis uh, that we are monitoring. Then we're just going to click drift. Um, you know, it's always uh, good. I don't remember if it automatically calibrates uh, first, but it's best practice to select a star first. Uh, click the green crosshairs to start tra uh, guiding and just let it do its calibration. And then once it's calibrated, uh, even though the calibration isn't needed, uh, since we're not guiding, guiding for imaging, I do believe it needs to know what the calibration is uh, in order to properly do the math to tell us, you know, where, where we're off. <clears throat> so we're going to click drift. And then as you can see, as it starts to go across the graph, you're going to have two, two bars, one blue, one red, depending on what color settings you have. Uh, this is default, I believe. Uh, the red, as you can see, is declination and blue is RA in my case. And the other thing you're going to watch is this purple circle that's around the guide star. It's going to grow. It's going to shrink. It's going to be bouncing around. These lines are going to be bouncing up and down as it, go, as it drifts across. So we don't want to watch it for 10 seconds, then make an adjustment, you know, watch it for 10 more seconds, uh, because that, that can just we can be chasing our tails based on, you know, again, uh, atmospheric conditions, seeing conditions, any number of things. So in my particular case, you can see there's the, the vertical bars here. I like to just let it run, let it drift till it's in between the second, you know, in this third quadrant here, um, in between the second and third vertical lines. Once it gets to there, based on uh, my experience, these lines pretty well smoothed out. And unless you have uh, windy conditions or something, uh, they, they're not going to uh, jump up and down too much beyond that. Um, and we're going to click adjust when we are done monitoring. And you're going to have your circle. Uh, you're going to, I believe it pops up. And this was the problem when I was recording this. I purposefully moved it away from the pole and I brought it back in so that I could record this and do the screen grabs. And everything was right on the line, as you can see. So, I mean, it was pretty darn close. And that little purple circle was really small it's actually inside that green box there and if it was larger you would move your star halfway uh halfway is what i've been told halfway is what i've always used um you know if you don't want to go to the edge of that circle let me go back one slide as you can see in that in the next slide that green cross goes away so you would move based on which direction that red line is. You'd want to move that star to about the midpoint of that circle. Um, you know, you kind of half split it. You're going to have to do it a couple times, but if you go all the way to the edge of the circle, that might be a little bit too much. And then you're going to have to back off. And then, you know, especially on my mount, uh, those azimuth, azimuth um, screws are, um, they're kind of a little wonky, you know, they, when you switch in directions, they, they, they kind of, they don't like to play nice because at this point we're locked down. I should, I should have mentioned that before. Once you got that red and green crosshair, lock everything down, uh, finalize, you know, assume that the, that is where you're going to be. Um, cause when you tighten down, uh, uh, especially in my case, if I'm moving the, the elevation up and then I lock down, uh, the screw, the locking, uh, screw, you know, it, it 
pushes pushes down and all of a sudden my crosshairs drop a little bit and then I got to loosen it back up, make another adjustment, tighten it back down. So, you know, at this point we should be locked in. So we're going to have to unlock everything and make our adjustments. But as you can see here, unfortunately, when I did this, I couldn't demonstrate a great failure scenario where I would have to do a drift alignment uh, because that, that, that line is pretty close to the, to the middle. And, you know, the, the declination, as it says in the instructions, watch the declination, which is red. And my purple circle, I'd be having to, I would have to make uh, some very fine adjustments uh, that I just cannot see. Uh, my eyes are not good enough to look at uh, that small of a of an image size uh, to see where I'm moving that that star inside that circle. Now, the one thing you can do this text box. Once you do this a couple times, you're going to know if uh, for example, if the red, uh, if the declination line is above, do I need to move it east or west or up or down uh, based on your, your uh, which, which axis you're running? You can actually put in there and it's going to persist the next time you open up PhD. So you can have a quick reference guide here that if I'm above center, I need to move west. If I'm below center, I need to move east. Uh, type of thing. So as you can see, I don't have anything here because uh, I did reinstall PhD2 due to uh, uh, an issue on my end. Um, and I lost all the settings I had, um, but I'd had the pole master at that point. And here I'm just demonstrating that you're going to move uh, that star to about the midpoint inside that circle when you are making your adjustments. And once again, once you get one axis done, click your the axis button here. So we were on altitude or we were on azimuth. You click, this would read altitude. Once you click it, this changes to azimuth and the banner changes to altitude to tell you which which uh, axis you're going to be monitoring, which axis you're going to need to adjust. And once again, we're going to monitor the deck trend line, which in this case is red. And that purple circle is pretty large right now, but it's early on the in the monitoring. And here we are. I did have a little bit of wind kick up right here in the middle which threw off the reading, so I had to watch it a little bit longer. But once again, pretty close to that center line. And that purple circle is really small. So as much as I wanted to get a good failure or uh, misalignment uh, shot for you, unfortunately, I did things a little too well using the pole master. And but how do how close are we? Um, you know, a lot of people focus on these RMS errors. Uh, they're good for in my opinion, they're good for evaluating how your tracking is going. Um, what they actually represent, I believe, is uh, pixels per arc second or. Uh, yeah, pixels and arc seconds, uh, error shot to shot uh, from your center. And those are going to jump around based on your, you know, uh, from my observation, based on your scene conditions and uh, other various options or items. So uh, I don't like to use this when I'm evaluating my post polar alignment. Instead, I go into guiding assistant which I run every night anyways, uh, just to make sure that my RA and deck settings uh, underneath the graph are set uh, correctly. But right down, whoops, let me go back. 
right down here, this bottom line. If you actually watch this, let this mon you know run run this monitor for 120 seconds, you know, two minutes, like it says. Uh, it actually says it. I had actually stopped it. It says monitor for at least two minutes. Uh, I like so elapsed time 120 seconds. These values down here should be fairly consistent. They're going to jump around a little bit, but it takes the whole graph into consideration. And they're going to be pretty, pretty well locked in at that point around, you know, two, two and a half minutes. And as you can see this night, I did a really good job and got my polar alignment error to sub one arc minute. Um, normally I'm sitting around uh, 1.2 to 0 0.9. Uh, this, unfortunately, for the presentation was the best I'd ever done. Um, so the, the past week, I have left it alone. I did not want to mess with it, if you can understand what I'm saying. Um, so that brings us to the end. I just want to say a couple of thanks. First, thank you to the Astro Imaging channel uh, for letting me to present and uh, for having this great forum for other presenters to do their thing and to give us uh, knowledge. I've, I personally have gained a lot of knowledge over the past year just by watching, going back and watching this channel on YouTube uh, all the way back to the beginning. Uh, second, I want to thank all the presenters that have stepped up uh, in the past and the upcoming future. Uh, you know, it's all great information. So thank you for stepping up. As much as we like to uh, have those open sessions where we can just post questions and get answers, you know, from the, the guys here, you know, uh, they, they like to have presenters and, you know, it, the open sessions, uh, it, it was from a viewing standpoint, uh, you know, they, they got a little monotonous after a while, uh, you know, nothing against the channel. That was just, it's just the nature of things. Uh, so thanks to all the presenters that have stepped up uh, in the past and going forward. Uh, I know I, I personally appreciate it. So thank you. And next, I want to say thanks to Molly. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, she brought up, uh, I have it listed here as LVA, the Light Vortex Astronomy page. Uh, so I want to thank Molly. I'd never seen that page before. And the, tutorial, the tutorials that are on that page for processing and Pix Insight have uh, opened my eyes and helped me understand uh, some of the stuff Warren Keller talks about in his book, which I have also been reading. So between the Light Vortex Academy or Astronomy webpage and um, the, well, I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, so between LVA and Warren Keller's book, which I highly recommend both to anybody out there, uh, you know, it, it's been a godsend in, in my opinion. Uh, so thank you, Molly, if you're out there. Uh, I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And lastly, all of this, um, you know, if you go to these three web, uh, these three YouTube videos, uh, I, ha I personally have them on my, uh, my channel uh, unboxing. So you'll see what you get inside uh, the box when you order the Pole Master, as well as a better uh, look at uh, installing the Pole Master. And then my first use of using it, uh, you know, roughly uh, nine, 10 months ago. And I've learned a lot since then, but you know, it's, you know, if you're having uh, issues, your first use, you know, go, go check those out. Maybe it'll help you out. I don't know, but they're there if you want to use them. So uh, with that, I am done for my presentation. I want to thank everybody for watching. And again, thanks to uh, TAIC for letting me, you know, present what I know and as far as I know it. Thank you very much, Ryan, for presenting that. And thank you for the kind words. Um, it's really good to hear them from somebody else. You know, I've been sitting here saying, hey, we need presenters. Ryan did a pretty good job, even after his, um, you know, he was a little shy um, at first saying, hey, you know, like, this is just me telling you what I'm doing. But you guys realize that that's all we ever do. That's all Tolga does. I do, Eric, anybody with the presenters just get up here and kind of tell you what we know. 
We do have some questions, Ryan, so hang in there. We're going to go after, go for some questions. Um, let's see. You, you're mentioning about um, uh, uh, will, pull, will uh, PhD do a calibration. Uh, it will do a calibration if it has never been calibrated before or if you told it to um, clear the old calibration. But um, if it does have a calibration, then it, it won't do a new calibration. Now, for many of us, we're moving around and in installing the camera again. And so it may be at a slightly different orientation. So you should do your calibration over again before you, before you need to do any of this other stuff. Um, and then there's some other questions that were answered internally. Some of the other people pitched in. I have a question about um, when you have your... Um, the, the little green circle in PhD telling you how far away basically you're going to go. And you said move the star up. Um, now, on your rig, does that mean that if the line is, if the red line is above the zero line, that you have to move the star up? Um, and that would vary from rig to rig, I guess. Is that what that means? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah, it's, it, you're, you're, I move it either RA, you know, uh, uh, azimuth or, or yeah. altitude. Um, I, I choose one and I move it half way through the circle. I okay. choose a direction. Like I said, I lost my notes, so I'm not sure if it, if above is, west east uh you know i'm not sure yeah. but i move it half re you know monitor again see uh -huh. if it got better or worse if it got worse okay you know yeah move but, it but the other direction but if you were if once you wrote it down once you've done it enough times you can figure out which it is and if the line is above you know next time you got to move it up or, or whatever whatever you learned from the first you know from your trials and you Correct. can write that in your notes okay cool um uh, John at Astra wants to know if the RA and deck errors um, when you're um, are, are significantly different when you I think that's when you're running your um, uh, polar alignment, not your polar alignment, your um, guiding assistant. If the RA and deck efforts are differ significantly, what does that mean when you're guiding? That is a good question. I am not 100 percent sure. I know that when you're using the guiding assistant mm -hmm. it stops guiding so it you know it's going to let it drift because it's going to assume that you're polar aligned mm -hmm. and the mount should be tracking so it is finding the variance between your mounts guiding and the movement of the star so they can say how much of those values that you need to plug in mm -hmm. there as far as you know how much of a boost or how much of a, uh, for lack of a better term, retardation of the, of the motors uh, that it needs to do. So when it's doing the guiding assistant, don't pay attention to those RMS errors. Just watch the graph, wait till it gets to two minutes, then focus on the numbers that are in the pop-up box and only wait, only focus on the RMS errors once you're actively guiding. Okay. That would be my opinion. And John, if you're asking about in general, um, if you're guiding, not talking polar alignment or the guiding assistant or any other reports like that, but just you're reading your statistics on the history graph on PhD2, and you find out that you've got a, a declination error of RMS, you know, three arcs uh, minutes or something like that, uh, arc seconds. Um, uh, that tells you how far off generally you are in polar alignment. Uh, there's also the seeing effect all the way through, but the seeing will be the same for both RA and DEC. But if they're differing, one is basically your polar alignment. That's your declination error, how much you've got to adjust each time. The other is your mount mechanics um, of how smooth your motor is running, your periodic errors and things like that. So if you've got two sets, if they're different, it's because they're measuring different things. Okay. The RA is measuring the uh, mount motors and mechanics, 
while the deck um, is measuring mostly your polar alignment. Uh, during the live guiding with the numbers. I, okay, and I think I answered that question to the best of my ability. Anybody else have anything to say? Uh, 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 Terry, did you have a question about um, what if you're imaging at several meters? Um, did you want to turn your mic on and, and ask that? Are you, you're not here anymore. Yes, you are. Or you're asleep. Uh, Terry at one point asked. Uh, <laughs> not asleep. <laughs> there you go. Go. He's back. <laughs> yeah, He's back. Uh, it took some time to get all the way down to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> you're guiding uh, the. Uh, my question was uh, when you're running a much longer focal length, is the accuracy um, good enough for longer, longer focal lengths? Uh, that I, I should have put that caveat in in early on. I am right. using a I am using uh, an Orion star shoot with a guide scope as opposed to an off axis guider. Right. Um, so, you know, yes, the longer focal lengths, you're going to have uh, fewer stars and they're going to be larger. Um, so that is going to affect your uh, tracking ability uh, as opposed to uh, using a like a refractor with a shorter focal length. Since I've never used those, I can't speak intelligently to that. Uh, I can only speak to what my setup is, which is a 60 millimeter uh, guide scope on the Orion star shoot. Okay, thank you. But um, when we're when we're talking pole master, we're talking about neither of those. You're basically pole master is the pole master, and you're getting it off. It's a camera and a lens and everything all in one, right? That is correct. Yeah. Right. So, it's not looking through the telescope. Pardon me. It's not looking through the telescope. Right. So not at all. The telescope is. Uh, so if it reports that you're getting one minute of error, you're getting that one minute of error, no matter what kind of scope you've got up above. Now, one minute of error may show more in a longer focal length than it does in a shorter focal length, but um, it's still pole master is reported the same error. Okay, I think we've got all the questions and there's a few comments thanking you for the presentation. Ryan, you did a good job and I have to echo those. Um, I appreciate it. Anybody else there have was, anything? There was a question. Oh, there was well, a question about uh, tripod. Uh, I know it's not maybe somewhat related, but there was a question above I saw. I don't know who it was. They were asking uh, if the tripod has to be level for polar alignment oh, or maybe right. specifically for pole master use. Uh, do, uh, in my opinion, um, the, the tripod should be level at all times once you've set it up. Um, yeah, I wouldn't even, I don't even put my. Uh, OTA on or the counterweights on until I make sure the tripod is uh, uh, level. And then once I get everything else on, I double check my level. Uh, that's part of my workflow, uh, simply because it's easier to make fine tune adjustments if you're already level and putting an OTA and counterweights on uh, throws you a little bit out of level. Yeah, when you adjust your altitude, the star goes up and down. It doesn't go at an angle if you're Correct. level. If Correct. you're at a level, when you make your adjustments. So the, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more. So the <clears throat> levelness of the tripod, it doesn't matter for polar alignment, period. So end the conversation. But there are advantages of ha making having a level tripod. One is the weight is distributed equally on the, on the tripod legs. You know, if you're leaning over... And the other one is what Brian just mentioned is that the adjustments are square to if you know they're square to your screen. Uh, up and down is up and down. If you're on an angle, up and down will move the star on an angle on your screen. So it's it makes it easier. But is it a requirement? No. Yeah, I I pulled back up the one slide that uh, zoomed in a little bit uh, where your where Polaris is to the right of the center circle or the the where it should be. If you're a little bit out of a out of balance, uh, you know, out of level, um, you're not going to be able to move exactly left and right. It is, you know, it might actually move just like that arrow, just a little, you know, it's going to move left, but it might move a little bit down as well. If you're perfectly level, that thing should go straight across and straight up and down. 
and that makes it so much easier when you are doing your polar alignment. Uh, like he said, it is not required, but it does make it because you can just move one and you're not having to guess how much on the other and which direction it's going to move. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is it's, it's the sim one of the simplest things you, you could do to your rig. Just uh, even every phone today has a little bubble level app you could download for free. Uh, you don't even need, need to bring uh, a level with you. Just put it on. Just, I mean, it, it takes literally, you know, 30 seconds to do. So why not do it? Yeah, and the Celestrons, uh, at least with the C gems that, uh, that I have, they have the bubble level on the tripod itself. So you don't even need to bring a level. It's built in. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it by me. Um, and uh, Steve Segarian is asking, do you use a dew heater? Uh, yes, I do use a dew heater and a dew shield as well. Um, I found the the dew shield does help with some erroneous light, like a car driving by, um, you know, porch lights coming on. Uh, you know, I'm in, I'm out in the wooded area, so those are few and far between, but it does help. And it also helps trap in a little bit of that heat uh, on an 11 inch HD, uh, Edge HD. Uh, if the night gets really cold, uh, the dew heater just can't uh, keep up. And the, there is a little bit of condensation around um, the center, you know, the, the secondary mirror. Uh, having that dew shield on does help contain that heat a little bit more. And I've never had a problem with that uh, uh, happening around the secondary mirror uh, using that. The drawback with the dew shield, though, is it acts like a wind sail. So if the projected winds are to be uh, gusting uh, 15 mile an hour or above, I don't use it because uh, it just throws the tracking off. Um, I don't have any tracking issues under 20, 25 mile an hour if I don't have the uh, dew, dew shield on. Okay, folks, we'll see you again next uh Sunday night when Danny Perry will be here to tell us about uh, what to use for power, all the battery questions that you like to ask. Uh, he'll be bringing a few samples and showing off and uh, I hope you come on back. Okay. So good night, everybody. Thanks again, Ryan. Great, great show. We're going to stop the broadcast. Here we go.